I, I have uh, one, two introductions I'd like to make. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, to a young lady standing over in the far corner of, the, uh, of our room. Uh, this is a new employee with uh, John Crossman's uh, organization, uh, Betsy Smith. Uh, she comes to, to this job with the qualification of being the, uh, the most recent captain of the University of Florida's volleyball team, a wonderful organization. So we appreciate your, your helping us keep this thing in the air. Um, the second introduction will be to the man who will introduce our Hall of Fame uh, nominee. And it's my great pleasure to uh, again call up on the stage uh, Dick Dunn. Destin down to Wellington and, and even into the Keys. 
you know, Ron's an avid diver, and, and uh, so they really span the state with with uh, their residences and time spent here. Um, so we welcome both of you today, and thank you for being here. After learning more about Ron's lifetime achievements, I truly was very humble to be able to make this introduction. Ron was born in Washington, D.C. He attended the United States Naval Academy, where he graduated with honors and played both baseball and basketball. Ron stayed very involved with the, with the Academy and later served as the director of the Academy's foundation and became the chairman of the athletic committee. In 2009, the Academy honored him as a distinguished graduate, one of a few career civilians to receive this recognition for his lifetime commitment to service, personal character, and distinguished contributions to our nation. After graduating from the Academy, he then went on to serve our country for five years as an officer with the U.S. Navy. After returning from service, he attended the Harvard Graduate School of Business, where he received his MBA with high distinction and was elected a Baker Scholar, the highest academic honor given to the top 5% of the graduating MBAs. Ron then, after graduating with his MBA, started his real estate career at Sea Pines in Hilton Head, South Carolina in 1970. In 1978, he made the move to Trammel Pro Company and formed a partnership with the legendary Trammel Pro. And focused uh, with, the, with that partnership, which was Pro to Riller at that time, to focus on uh, development of multifamily properties in the eastern half of the United States. Their strategy was at that time to take a proven development model and scale it nationally. They would capitalize each transaction through joint venture partners and then shared ownership with local development partners. By 1986, Ron had consolidated the company and took the lead as its chairman and CEO what is today known as Trammell Pro Residential. Became a national real estate company quickly, and as the largest developer of multifamily housing in the United States for the past several decades. In 2007, 2008, 2009, TCL ranked number one on multifamily, multifamily executives' top 50 list of builders having started in that period alone 27,000 units. As TCR grew under Ron's leadership, he not only developed nearly 250,000 housing units across the U.S., he also recruited and developed leaders. By having TCR executives as owners of the business, everyone's interests were aligned to share not only in profits, as well as losses. The opportunity for a TCR partner to control his or his or her own destiny and create personal wealth attracted some of the best and brightest real estate entrepreneurs in the country. He amassed an all-star lineup of developers that expanded the TCR model nationally. There are a number of highly successful development companies that exist today that emanated or had spun off from TCR, the TCR platform, including such well-known residential firms as Wood Partners, Gables Residential, Avalon Bay, Alliance Residential, and Mill Creek Residential. All people tied to the TCR platform originally. Doug Bibby, who is the presiding president of the National Multi-Housing Council, says what speaks volumes about Ron, his leadership, and the imprint that TCR has had on our industry is that so many quality leaders came from there and are now out across our landscape leading their own major real estate companies. As an insider, the TCR told me, Ron has helped make a lot of people wealthy. He is a great recruiter and predictor of talent. He is very driven, very aggressive, but yet focused intensively on managing financial risk. 
Many developers come to the business with a construction background. Ron came to it with a financial background and a strong capital markets acumen. He was keen on staying on top of the trends. He was personally involved in every transaction at TCR as the de facto investment committee of one. He spent most of his time visiting his partners and their projects across the country. From his days playing collegiate sports, he knew it took an entire team of top-notch players who worked together in order to get to the top. It is clear that he used the same concept in building the TCR dynasty. His conviction to his belief that hope begins with access to a decent, affordable home resonates through his body of work. Let me share some highlights of this remarkable journey with you. In 06, Ron received the Hearthstone Builder Humanity Award for his commitment to housing-related charities. The award is the single largest charitable award program in the home building industry and its most coveted. In 2007, Ron was appointed chairman of the board for Habitat for Humanity. Ron served on the board of directors for Habitat since 2000. He is the past chairman of the international board of directors of Habitat, and he currently chairs Habitat's $4 billion global capital campaign. In 2008, Ron was inducted into the National Association of Home Builders Housing Hall of Fame in recognition of his efforts to advance housing opportunities for all Americans. Then in 2009, to further advance his involvement in Habitat for Humanity, he made an historic $100 million commitment to the organization. It's not a misprint in your program. It's $100 million commitment to Habitat for Humanity. The nine-figure legacy gift represents the largest donation from an individual in Habitat's history. The donation will help an estimated 60,000 low-income families around the world improving their housing. The donation will also establish the Ronald Terrillo Leverage Impact Fund. This endowment for Habitat for Humanity will make annual distributions to help support affordable housing efforts. 2009, he is honored by the National Housing, National housing Council with Person of the Year for his commitment and contributions to the affordable housing community. In 2010, Ron is elected as chairman of the board of Enterprise Partners. Enterprise is a leading provider of the development capital and expertise to create decent, affordable homes and rebuild the community. Ron has been a member of the board of trustees since 2007 and made a $5 million gift to the foundation targeted to create 2,000 affordable homes annually. Since 1982, Enterprise has raised and invested more than $11.5 billion in equity, grants, and loans to help build nearly 300,000 affordable homes and created 410,000 jobs nationwide through that program. 2012, Ron is honored with the National Patriotism Award, awarded by the National Foundation for Patriotism. Today, Ron serves as the founder and chairman of the ULI Twin River Center for Housing that is also the result of a $5 million gift that he made to the Urban Land Institute. He previously served as chairman of the Urban Land Institute and currently serves on its governance committee. He is past chairman of the National Association of Home Builders, past chairman of the Atlanta Neighborhood Development Partnership, past chairman of the Ward of Real Estate Center, and chairman of the board for I Have a Dream Foundation. Today he serves at the national level as co-chairman of the Economic Policy Council of the Bipartisan Policy Center uh, for Housing Commission. The Economic Policy Project focuses on federal economic and fiscal policy and its ramifications within the larger national economy. Ron was quoted as saying, as long as God gives me good health, I ought to use my talents, my energies, and my money to help people. I made my wealth in housing, and I know an awful lot about it. 
I can have an impact working in that area, so I've chosen to dedicate the rest of my life to help provide housing solutions to people around the world. So with all the negativity that emanates around our media channels uh, daily, it is truly refreshing to have luminaries like Ron and the rest of our Hall of Fame members remind us of the importance and great benefit of giving back. So now you can see why Ron Turner was so readily and deserving of admittance into the Berkshire Center Hall of Fame. We congratulate you not only for this award, but for all the remarkable lifetime achievements that you've accomplished. And for setting a great, great example for all of us and reminding us of the, rel the relevance of civil service and the importance of philanthropy. So ladies and gentlemen, please stand and join me in congratulating Don <laughs> You know, I'm a very lucky guy um, in many ways. I have a beautiful wife who's here with me. Um, I'm healthy. I have uh, two great daughters and four grandchildren. And probably as much as anything, I'm lucky for having been born in the United States in the 20th century. And, and I've lived the American dream. And for some, that was a house that's no longer the dream. But for me, it's coming from a family um, who had very limited means. My, my father never made $10,000 a year, but he provided food and clothing, and we lived in this little, I, at ULI, I started the Workforce Housing Center, and I grew up in workforce housing, 800 square foot, three bedroom, one bath uh, house. Um, I always tell the story of myself. My brother's the Stanford MBA, so I kind of thought they were secondary, but he, he outsmarted me one day. I woke up, uh, we slept in the same bed in this, little house and we had this small room next door and I woke up one day at 12 and said you know I'm the older brother and I deserve my own bedroom so I immediately proceeded to move next door into the little teeny bedroom not realizing that now he had his own room it was way bigger than I so started out a little short that way um, and, and I was able to, to go to college because I was a recruited athlete my parents could not afford to send me I think they wanted me to go to college. They didn't take me to a college. And, and one of the things Dick mentioned that I do now, it's a little bit of a side thing, and, and my wife Fran's somewhat involved with me now in this, is I chair an educational foundation called the I Have a Dream Foundation in New York. And what we try to do is help poor kids, principally inner city kids, get to and through college. 
realizing that a college degree is the way out and the way up for so many of them. Um, so I got to college kind of through athletics. Um, the journey from there was a little unusual. I really wanted to be an aviator, but when I was 17, I found out I had a back problem. The Naval Academy let me in. I played two sports for four years. Interestingly, they said, uh, when I told them I wanted to be a pilot, they said, you're not physically qualified to be a pilot. So uh, I picked the Supply Corps and went into the Navy Supply Corps, but because I was a basketball player, I got to play for subland and go into submarine, the, the submarine force. I was on a nuclear-powered submarine for a couple of years, and I applied for the Harvard-Stanford program, and they made me a first alternate, the Navy did, but Harvard let me in, so I ended up resigning and going to Harvard Business School. So there's so many twists and turns, I suspect, in all of our lives. I could have been a Naval career officer, and I am very committed to the Naval Academy. Uh, I don't know how many of you've been there, and we always think uh, West Point is almost as good. We've actually beaten them 11 straight times, in case anybody wanted to know. <laughs> uh, and Air Force uh, is, is trying to come back, but I'm proud of, I'm proud of that experience. I had, a, I had the great good fortune to find real estate, to find Charlie Frazier at Sea Pines, to subsequently find Tremel Crow. Uh, two great visionary men, kind of no downside thinking. They, uh, they really were futurists. And, and uh, Trammell, of course, is a legend in the industry, a very charismatic man. Um, you know, Dick mentioned it, but Trammell wanted to do business through partnership. And so I was blessed as a guy who joined him at 38 years of old with maybe a $250,000 net worth to have been able to accumulate uh, a lot of wealth because of the partnership concert, concept that Trammell pioneered. Uh, today I consider myself a philanthropist, uh, enabled by my development career. Um, so I'll, I'll talk just a little bit to you about that. You know, coming from nothing, as I began to accumulate some wealth in my mid-50s, it occurred to me I really needed to think about what responsibility I had, what to do with this money. Um, I had grown up in this great country. I'd been able to go through decent public schools. And I decided that I really needed to begin to think about how to give back. Uh, so when I stepped down as CEO of Trammell Pro Residential in uh, 2008, I began looking at the next chapter in my life. And if some of you heard about Jim Rouse earlier today, what you may not know, Jim Rouse built the new town of Columbia. He started Enterprise Community Partners at 65 years of age. Uh, that's a board I chair now. It's based in New York and Columbia. Uh, so it seemed to me there were some examples of people who, you know, as the book Half Time suggests, the first half of your life is for success. Securing the financial future of your family, the second half is for significance. So I moved into the significance phase. Um, I'm also doing a little real estate uh, again, and so my wife completely suggests I have flunked retirement. Uh, but I don't think it's in my nature. So, you know, there are so many people in need. I just was in Costa Rica last week meeting with the wealthiest Costa Ricans because they do not have a culture of philanthropy in Costa Rica. In fact, outside the United States, a lot of countries don't have the kind of philanthropic giving that goes on in this country. Uh, so I'm working worldwide for Habitat trying to get people to donate to housing. Because we believe, I believe, that a simple, decent home is the foundation for life for families. And, and although our research shows that uh, Americans and people worldwide give to health and education, first and second, um, without a simple, decent house, how are those kids going to have a good health and education outcome? If the family lives under a bridge, where are they going to come home and study? What kind of health care are they having? In Costa Rica, we started a new initiative uh, just to put concrete floors in housing so the kids won't get sick from the infestation coming through the raw ground. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's a challenging problem. The UN says over 1.6 billion people uh, in poverty housing around the world. 
<laughs> Miller Fuller, God bless him, uh, who was our founder at Habitat, he wanted to eliminate poverty housing worldwide. And, and so we're about that. Uh, obviously, we can't build our way through, through it, but through partnering with governments and partnering with social, social responsibility firms and individuals, we're, we're making it. Habitat this year will serve 100,000 families worldwide, which was the initial goal of the campaign I chair. Um, in the United States, I have just finished a year serving on the Bipartisan Policy Center Housing Commission. Um, I have argued strongly that we need to rework federal housing policy. Just to take a minute on this, we spend about $230 billion a year in this country on federal housing support, 75% of which goes to home ownership, 75% of which goes to people making over $150,000 a year. A, a totally nonsensical policy. Uh, the 1949 Housing Act suggests as a goal for this country that every American family have the opportunity to have an affordable home in a suitable neighborhood. Well, today we have 40 million renters, 10 million of whom spend more than 50% of their income on rentals. So we've got a lot of people suffering and unable to afford, whether it's home ownership or rental housing in a decent location, close to transit or their jobs. We've got a lot of work to do, so, you know, I'm an advocate for reworking this, the, the system. I've been uh, on my own nickel for over a year now lobbying Congress, just trying to educate them, uh, educate them on the housing conditions in this country. Um, and the Bipartisan Policy Center, chaired by uh, George Mitchell, who's a great man who helped broker peace in, in Northern Ireland, and, my good friends Mel Martinez, who was hoping to be here today, you all know from Orlando, former Senator HUD Secretary Henry Cisneros and Kit Bond. We all came together and we're delivering a report to Congress arguing for more support for affordable rental housing. Seventy percent of the households in this next decade are minority. And minorities own homes at a rate of less than 50 percent. So we're working hard to see if we can't get the government to redirect some of their funding and be more responsive to affordable rental housing. And that's kind of where my uh, focus is now. So, you know, just to conclude, I, I feel like if, the God, if God gives me good health um, and my wife has plenty of patience, uh, my best, best and most important work is ahead of me. And uh, I hope those of you who've had good fortune like I have will think about what you're doing to help those less fortunate, because even in this country, uh, there are a whole lot of people that need our help. Thank you very much for this honor.